Welcome to the Spirit Led Podcast, your guide on a journey to full enlightenment in this beautiful life. I'm your host, Joan Hope Craig. Each episode, we explore spiritual wisdom, life's purpose, and the profound impact of daily choices on our personal growth and the world. All right. Well, welcome, beloved divine listeners, and welcome to our beloved divine guest, Daniel Bledsoe. Hello, everyone. Glad to be with you all here. Thanks for joining us today. I'll introduce you briefly to the audience, Daniel. Daniel is an Ayurvedic practitioner. He's also an ordained minister in the Kriya Yoga tradition. He met Roy Eugene Davis in 2013. He's one of the most calm and grounded people I know. And today I invited Daniel to come speak with us about Ayurveda and how it can help us. So welcome again, Daniel. Thank you very much, Joan. It really is a pleasure to be here with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll start with the easy question. Tell the listeners where you live and where you're from. Okay. So I live in Kingsport, Tennessee, Northeast Tennessee. Um, I was born and raised here. I've lived a few different places, but this is where I have always circled back to and come back home. Um, I started studying with Roy, Roy Eugene Davis, in 2013 and immediately fell in love with his teaching. And after studying with him for several years, um, during a conversation, he inspired me to start looking into Ayurveda. And I began my training in 2016 for that and uh, finished up my training with Kerala Ayurveda Academy in 2019. And I have done my clinical internships both in India and in California and Asheville as well. And it's just been a lovely experience that has been nothing but just spiritually and physically rewarding. I really appreciate his inspiration for that. All right. So, yeah, that sounds like Roy had a sense that it would be a good path for you. I'm not sure how he sensed that, but um, it, it seems like it opened up some doors for you. And so maybe for our audience, I'm guessing we have some listeners who are quite familiar with Ayurveda and are, are using some of the principles in their lives. But just give us an overview of what it is. Um, and what are some of the benefits? Sure. So Ayurveda means, the word Ayurveda means the science or study of life. Ayur means life and Veda means knowledge. So Ayurveda is accordingly the study of our existence, spiritually, physically, emotionally, whatever level you want to talk about, we can. Um, it's been practiced for over 5,000 years at this point. It's one of the oldest medical systems that we have, and it is truly holistic in its in its nature because it does really look at us as an entire experience, not just as a living machine with parts to interact, but as a synergistic and comprehensive entity. So physical wellness has to do with emotional wellness and has to do with spiritual wellness as well. And when we have all of these aspects of our being in harmony, we experience what to us could be optimal health. That's different for everyone based on ability and age and all of those things. But optimal health brings optimal function. And that, I believe, is something of very big importance. Because if we are not optimally healthy in our, in our own self, then we can't share that with anyone else. So Ayurveda uses, you don't have a person on herbal medicine, pranayama, yogic medicine. So to achieve our optimal health, Ayurveda has a variety of tools that it uses to help us reach this level. We have herbal medicine that we can apply towards our body and also emotional wellness and spiritual wellness too. We can use herbs for their physical properties, of course. But the practice of harvesting these herbs in Ayurveda allows us to see the other components of this as well, because we don't just go out, grow the herbs, harvest them, and use them for medicine. There are time frames 
that we go out because the prana in the ground and in the skies gets more pronounced for certain conditions, certain qualities of our experience based on lunar cycles, solar cycles. And that's observed in the Vedas, astrological um, information there. There are also specific chants for different herbs based on what we're using them for. If we're, if, let's say we're going out for Brahmi, which is personally my favorite herb. Um, it is really great for cognition and overall brain and mind health. Brahmi is very similar to Brahma, and that relates both its potency and its spiritual importance because that herb is wonderful for our mind. That is why it's called Brahma, because that is what creates our universe. Our minds are how we understand and interact with our universe. Brahmi is the name of the herb, and that's just the feminine component of that. So it helps us grow, helps us understand that level of being for ourselves. When we gather those herbs, we chant different mantras for those for those deities, which everyone are, re are related to it archetypes, if you will, you like the word deity, that's fine. And those chants help us reinvigorate in ourselves our purpose, reaffirm that in ourselves. We are chanting that to the plant to ask for its help in those matters. We are asking for help from the universe for our well-being and focusing on that while we're gathering our herbs to share with others or with ourselves. And the preparations which we make from the herb after that accordingly also have those same levels of detail involved in them so at the end of the product at the end of the process the product that we have is charged both by its physical properties but also our spiritual energies that we've imparted into which we can share them with everyone else. Mm, really fascinating i actually i did not know a lot of those things you just shared about ayurveda even though i've of course been familiar with the basics for a while so what I'm hearing is that it's for optimal health and it takes into consideration physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health, all of the aspects. But also what I'm learning today is that even if I went and bought some Ayurvedic herbs off of a shelf in a natural food store, it's quite possible that those herbs were cultivated by someone who was putting that intention um into their into their growth right and into their harvest so they may have been uh, at certain key times of the seasons or of the day or of um, astrological ast astrological cycles or it may have been um, that they were praying while they were doing it do i understand that right very much so um the kerala ayurveda academy they have a sister school in india that's where i did my internship well, they're a seed to shelf pharmacy as well as a, as well as the community clinic and um, educational center. So they grow their own herbs for their own processes. And while in the Ayurvedic text, you do read about in the classical text, you do read about like various mantras and things for the gathering of herbs. That's one thing that I I was kind of dubious about. I'm like, I don't know if people are actually doing that. But when I went over and got to witness that, we went out to the herb gardens, which there are acres of, and you see that that's actually how they're practicing it. They do actually go out and for the specific herbs, various time frames are allotted to gather them. Different lunar cycles are important, both because that is obviously when the plant is blooming the best, or is growing the most leaves, if that's the part of it that you're using, those have physical components that the universe are obvi is obviously affecting the plant with. The lunar cycles, solar cycles, also impart more subtle prana, of course, and that's where the chants come into play. And to see, the, to see those actually being used was really life-changing because, well, was perspective shifting for me. Because... Is just a beautiful process. The amount of intent that goes into the cultivation, growing, and eventual processing of these plants into their corresponding medicines is just—it's just magical. To see. 
Mm. Super interesting. And it goes along with what I learned from Royal Eugene Davis, which is that prana goes where intention and attention flow. So that makes a lot of sense. But if you don't mind, let's back up. Because I can tell you're really passionate about the herbal medicine, which is great. But I also wanted to hear about the other um, aspects of Ayurveda that might be used in treatment. I think you mentioned pranayama and yoga poses and maybe other lifestyle things. What else would you as a practitioner recommend to a patient or client that can't comes to you besides herbs? Of course. So I am very passionate about the herbal medicine because that is, it is very useful and you can see results re relatively quickly that way, depending on the condition. However, my most favorite aspect of Ayurveda is actually not the herbal medicine. It's the um, psychological perspective that it takes on everything. And what I mean by that is that really pulls into and pulls together the physical well-being and spiritual well-being because the psychology of how we experience our world, that's the tie between both of those. If we don't feel balanced psychologically, we can't feel that way spiritually. And accordingly, we're probably not going to feel that way physically. So Ayurveda uses a lot of meditative techniques. It ties really well into Kriya Yoga because they're two sides of the same coin. It's just Kriya Yoga helps us understand what the processes are and how to do these things. And Ayurveda helps us understand when and why to use them. And so if I were doing like a distance call with someone, most often I may recommend them some herbs, but most often it's going to be pranayama techniques and different meditative techniques because that can really reshape how our perspectives are with our lives, which can then have physical repercussions, of course, and spiritual balancing effects as well. And for me, I find the psychological and spiritual medicine to be the most powerful aspects of Ayurveda mm. because they can really change how we view ourselves and our world, which can have such deep effects. Right. And it's not one size fits all because you used the term balance a couple times just now. Um, could you talk about balancing what, what, you know, you say, well, we might recommend this pranayama to balance for the person. What, tell us more about that. Sure. So Ayurveda has, um, anyone who's familiar with Ayurveda done any reading probably has heard the words Vata, Pitta, Kapha. And those are the three doshas. That is, they represent um, functional aspects of our being, but they also represent different types of people. So Vata types tend to be more mobile, airy, and uh, sometimes spacey, but they, they're the creative types. Pitta people are more, not necessarily type A, but almost every type A person will be a Pitta-related person because they're very driven, passionate about what they're doing, and intense in what they are doing. Um, Katha type people tend to be more sedentary, but not in a negative connotation. They are the ones who will always listen to us. They are the ones who will always give us a hug. Katha people tend to be the most loving people. Sedentary, possibly but always the most loving. So Ayurveda looks at those three boxes, not as individual boxes, but more of a, they overlap like a Venn diagram. Everyone has a balance of those three. And with that being the case, that means everyone's treatment would be somewhat different because of their individual balance of those three doshas. <clears throat> so with pranayama, if we were doing Let's take a Bastrika breath, the, the, just a simple bellows breath, deep abdominal breathing, using your abdomen to just pump the air in and out of your lungs. For a Vata type, they are being more airy, more spacey, more easy to hyperventilate. We don't want to breathe super fast with that Bastrika. We want a controlled fire. So what are bellows for? They are for stoking flames, our internal flames, our spiritual energies, sure. Physical energies, sure. Prana in general, of course. So we do slow, deep, but controlled Bastrika. Maybe take a full two seconds for each inhalation, exhalation. Oh, I'm loving what you're saying, Daniel. I, I just love how you gave those specific examples. And um, the audience can't see me, but I was laughing at myself because those that know me, I am 
a very much a vata pitta. I'm made of air and fire. And I actually took a yoga class a couple weeks ago and they did some Vastrika, the bellows breath and a few other fast breathing techniques. And that night I couldn't even get to sleep because I'm so easily stimulated. And so I know for myself, I often have to balance my air and fire and ground it and calm it down. And then I married a big, huge kapha bear, you know, who's the sweetest human on the planet, but, you know, a big, you know, he, he he's not a lot of um, air and fire. He's grounded. So I just love, I love how you explain that. And I love the specific example of, of, okay, you can even do the same pranayama, but you need to do it in a different way. The airy person needs to do it slower and calmer. Yeah. That's exactly it. And that's, that's what I really like to share with people because everything that we learn can be overwhelming. But everything that we learn can also be applicable for us. It doesn't have to be esoteric and, you know, on a shelf that I learned this and I'm never going to use it because it's not technically practical for me. You can make it applicable and practical for you if we just pay attention to how. Yes, I love I love the practicality of Ayurveda and I love the doshas and being able to think about the elements of nature. It's it's simple to see, okay, if you're playing tennis at at noon to 2 p.m. in July in the south of the US, you know, it's going to be hot and you could get overheated, right? It's like it's kind of common sense. <laughs> it is. It is observational common sense. And like we were just talking about with the elements to segue towards that just a smidge, um, the building blocks of the doshas are the five elements, and then we have different qualities that are associated with those. Without going too technical into those, the different qualities are both how we isolate how to bring balance towards a person, but also how they most likely are to interact with their own reality. So if we, and it's just breaking it down into steps, so we have like Heavy and light, hot, cold, smooth and rough. If we think about those, that gives us a balance between the three doshas because heavy and light, that's kapha or vada. Because kapha is the most dense and vada is the most airy. So heavy and light, hot and cold. That is pitta for hot, of course. Kapha can be cold, vada can be cold. So we have a balance point there. Smooth or rough. Rough tends to be more vada because we can get wind burned if we're on a windy day. The air is not necessarily frictionless. Then we have smooth, which is kapha, any type of existence in our body. Like what protects your stomach from acid? Mucus. It is very smooth. It is very slimy, sticky. That is the essence of kapha in a physical substance. So when we, I like that you mentioned going outside because that is one of my favorite practices for Ayurveda is learning what these words mean as a, as they apply to us. So we go outside. We are sitting in the grass. If we're sitting outside right now, personally, my area is a little chilly. So we go outside, the wind's blowing. We can feel the roughness of the air against us. We can feel how subtle it moves through our clothes to actually touch our skin, even though it's not piercing through that cloth. It moves around it. That's a subtle aspect of Vata. We can feel the heat from the sun on our skin because it's radiant and light, and that is pitta. But that lightness, it also shares with vata because what is what is lighter than air? Nothing, not much. The stability and solidity of the ground, the earth itself, that is our stabilizing kapha for our day. So if we ground ourselves in like a nice outdoor meditation, we can really experience a balance of the doshas or see which qualities of them are inflaming us, aggravating us. Are we getting too cold? Is the wind too subtle and it's making us really anxious? Then we need to balance that vata with some kapha. Mm, I love all those examples. And as you were talking about meditating outside, I just had this picture of St. Lin. Remember from the pictures with him and Yogananda and how he loved to sit on the beach, supposedly, and meditate. And I thought he's probably a pitta because he was great in business, 
right? He had um, succeeded in business and he was very disciplined and dedicated to his meditation practice. So I'm, I'm guessing he liked that warm sun as well. It seems like a good transition, what you were just talking about meditation. So talk about more, a little bit more about how Ayurveda can support us in our actual meditation practice. So again, we're going back to the balance of the doshas. We need to have an understanding of what those words mean first. When we do have an association of those with how we exist, vada is creative, it is airy, it is mobile. Pitta is focused, it is intense, it is dissected because it breaks things down. Anything digested in our body, whether it be food or information or visual information, auditory, whatever type of information has to be digested. That's Pitta. Kapha is what allows us to understand. It allows us to exist. It allows us to actually be present in space-time. Because the other two are can be immaterial. Fire is plasma. It's not touch. It's not um, tangible. Air, also, we know it exists, but it's not very physical. Kapha allows us to be stable in our mind. So when we start out our meditation, we sit down, feel your body. How stable are you? Are we in a comfortable position? If not, adjust accordingly. We need to be comfortable. We need to be stable. That is how we get to our asana. Like the Yoga Sutras say, asana, um, stiram sukham asanam. An asana has to be stable and comfortable. That is also kapha. That's balanced kapha. If we are not stable and we are not comfortable, then our kapha is off. Somehow. So when we set to meditate, we isolate that. Identify how you feel. Identify how you think. How are we interacting with our body mentally and emotionally? Is our pitta being too hot? Is it trying to dissect us? Be like, no, we're not doing this technique correctly. We're not, we're not focused in it. We're not looking at this correctly. We're doing this or something else. We need to bring that back to a balance and just have the light of our enlightened consciousness shining forth. That's the pitta that we need. Vata one of the, okay, to go into a technical moment for a second, one of the subtypes of vata dosha is prana, which is why pranayama affects vata so well, because it's interacting with one of its main types. So when we breathe, we can feel the air moving into our lungs, out of our lungs. We can feel that sensation if we become aware of it. Think about that. Let's look at how our vata is moving within us. Does your breath feel raspy? Does it feel coarse? Does it feel smooth and subtle? We can move it towards a point of balance by just focusing on that. Different breathing techniques open those different pathways and have, allow those different experiences to balloon. Which, if we refer back to what we were talking about earlier, the different types of pranayama, the different speeds that we do them at, they do relate to different doshas. Lower breathing, more kapha balancing. Faster breathing, more vada balancing or vata aggravating, depending on where we're sitting at. We have to pay attention to those subtle details, even though it sounds complicated. Again, it's really just, how is your body feeling? How is your mind feeling? How is your heart feeling? How is your breath? If you ask those four questions, then you have a good balance on, a good check-in on how your doshas are balanced, how you're experiencing them. And when you have an answer to those, I feel uncomfortable in my seat then our coffin needs to be balanced and we need to fix that difference. My mind is really agitated. Then bring it back to center. That's okay. It's just an observation of balance within ourselves. Thank you. I love how you explain things, Daniel, because uh, you explain it in a way that empowers the individual, as you said, to check in with themselves. And while it's beneficial, and that's why you do the work you do, to meet with someone who is an expert at Ayurveda and get guidance for clear, specific things, also we can apply our common sense and notice when we're out of balance and, and shift things in the other direction. So thank you for presenting it in that way. Of course. That's one of the, that is my favorite thing about Ayurveda is how it is very eminently practical. It, is, it can be as heady and as theoretical as you want it to be because it, we can talk about cosmic philosophy. That is okay. That is a giant part of Ayurveda. That's where the physical part comes from. 
But until we actually understand what those things are and how they relate to us, those concepts, then they're not going to be anything but heady philosophy. And that's useless in life. I personally, for any of my clients, when we first start out talking, I usually talk to them a lot more than I end up later on because for me, healing is an internal work for the individual, not for a physician. The physician comes into play and helps us understand what's going on. Maybe offers advice on how to go different pathways towards healing. But seldom in any culture do we go to the doctor and receive healing because that's not technically their job. The body, our body, have to heal themselves. That's the crux of any. And Ayurveda, to me, empowers us to understand that fact and empowers us to understand that we can intentionally direct our energy, our prana, towards those outcomes in different ways, some better than others, some more optimal than others, rather, through our understanding. Yeah, and as as you were talking, I was thinking about that it it is it's both it's the physical and the spiritual because in both we do what we can to create the environment and the circumstances for the results right we don't make the results happen so we use ayurveda to create an environment where our body can do its own healing but we also can use ayurveda to create a meditative practice and spiritual practices that we do during the day that allow our awakening to happen. Right. Like Yogananda, you said, the spiritual world and the physical world are not set. They can't be set. Because if one created the other, and vice versa, then they can't be disconnected. They have to be connected imminently and permanently and always. Yeah. Daniel, would you, um, I, I want to I wanna just maybe pause and, Talk about some baby steps that someone could do to start integrating Ayurveda, like, for example, into their um, into their routines. Um, well, first off, anyone who is interested in Ayurveda, um, I would encourage them to pick up any of Dr. Vasant Lod's books, works on Ayurveda, because he is very, I enjoy his writing because he waxes poetic and makes everything beautiful to read but also beautifully practical. And he goes into some of the basic details like we've talked about here, like the doshas, the uh, gunas or qualities, attributes. Those are the heavy, light, hot, cold things. And he talks about the five elements as well. Um, but as far as the baby steps go, when we familiarize ourselves with the doshas, again, like just a general concept of those, pull that into our everyday life. Like, that is where Ayurveda looks at most primarily, because if we have an understanding of those, everything else kind of opens up in perspective. So when we get up in the morning, how does your body feel? How is your kapha? Do you feel stiff anywhere? If so, do something to balance that out. Do you feel like you need really mobile movement? Sometimes that's worse. We aggravate if our kapha is imbalanced and we toss in a lot of vata movement, a lot of like um, speedy movement, l running around, type A exercise, which can be pitta, but anything that's intense movement also has to be vata. Has to be. So sometimes that makes our joints hurt worse because we feel better for a moment and then we've overtaxed them. And the kapha is more aggravated because it's depleted, not just inflamed, no, it's depleted and inflamed. That's worse. So we need to be more sensible in those things. How is our body feeling? Bring it back to a balance point, which is usually gentle steps. If we force ourselves into these boxes, it gets rough. When we make our food for the day, we're planning our meals. How are you feeling? Do you feel irritable? Are we being agitated today? Or are we having a very peaceful day? Or are we having a dull, I really can't pay attention day? If we're having a dull, can't pay attention day, Top is imbalanced in a not so nice way. Add some more spices into your food. Maybe some cinnamon, something that helps stimulate but is not like super invigorating. Um, if our pitta is inflamed, we're having hyperacidity or we're feeling like irritable mentally, 
like we're burning up all of these things and dissecting them again in these not so nice ways. Aloe juice, have something cooling, something that is balancing towards Pitta. Like we need something that is just calming and stabilizing for us. And if our vada is aggravated, are we having like an anxious day? Are we just really flighty and our minds can't sit still? Are our bodies really fidgety today? Maybe have some chocolate. Something that's grounding, centering, and nice. We're being nice to ourselves. We don't want to make... We can't balance irritation, aggravation, and anxiety with torment. That does not work. We have to be kind to ourselves in those moments. If we don't have motivation to get up and do something, then we need something energizing. Not lighting a fire necessarily, but something energizing that can help us get up and be moving. Mm, that, that's really helpful. Yeah, those are really practical examples. And and I think it's so funny because sometimes we're drawn to the things that are nece not necessarily good for us, right? Like a, a Vata person wants to eat cold salad. You know, it's like, no. No, have some warm soup. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks for those practical examples. Well, um, could you tell the audience, I know you're leading a retreat at CSA this summer, and I'd love for you to tell them what to expect. Like, what would that be like when they go? Sure. So my ideas for the retreat are exactly what we're talking about here. Bringing the theory of Ayurveda into an immersive practical application. So I've got it broken up into different days focusing on different areas. The first day we come in and meet each other, we're going to have a theory day. That's probably going to be the most sedentary day because we need to be stabilized that we're in CSA and we're there for learning. So that day we're going to go over like philosophy and also Vada Pitakatha the Buddhas, the five elements, and the Gunas, the 20 attributes, the 10 pairs of attributes that I mentioned some of today. Um, we're going to go into what those words are, what they mean, and then we're going to go outside and experience some of them. How do they relate to us? Then we're going to have a day on focusing on digestion and Agni, the concept of Agni. Agni, if you look it up, um, in a Sanskrit dictionary, is both the deity of fire, one of the primary deities in the Vedic uh, philosophy, philosophical systems, as well as the term that we use in Ayurveda for our digestive capacity. So, Ayurveda views the body as a temple. That is true. In the center of that temple is a fire sacrifice. So, when we focus on Agni and how that feels, that's how the rest of our body is created. The body comes from what we digest. It has to. We are what we eat because that's what we are giving ourselves to make ourselves out of. So we isolate what and how the foods that we take in, the experiences that we take in, affect our, our, affect our body, affect our very existence. We're also going to do some tasting and some maybe some recipe sharing on, on that case so that we can understand how the different spices can bring balance to our doshas as well, bring balance to our lives, and also make friends with our spices and make friends with our food because so often I feel like we eat just because we're hungry and not necessarily that we're eating because it's what we needed, which not every meal has to be a chore, but Western medicine came from Greek. Hippocrates himself said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. I am a very big proponent of that because, again, what we eat is what we are. If we eat trashy inflammatory foods, I'm sorry that you're feeling bad, but I can't really expect you to feel any different. <laughs> Let's change that. Then we'll have a day for focusing on more movement and body awareness. Um, I, I have a background in martial arts. I started that almost 20 years ago at this point, which is surprising to say. Um, but I, I really enjoy Qigong and Tai Chi and those conscious movements because that is physical pranayama. You're focusing on your breath and how it interacts with your body. Bringing that understanding is really eye-opening for our daily experience of life. 
And we're also going to have um, a day focusing on Ayurvedic psychology and spirituality, which also ties in. I believe that we're going to have a Kriya Yoga initiation that same day. So that will be very fun for us, I believe. Um, but that afternoon, I want to go into like the more fun aspects of Ayurveda and meditation and what those words actually mean to who we are. Instead of having meditation as a practice that we do once a day, meditation is interacting with your mind. That's what we're doing all of the time. Just some things I'd like to share. I want I want the retreat to be an immersive experience, not just a theoretical experience, an immersive practical experience. Mm, that sounds wonderful. I hope that some of our listeners will go sign up on the CSA website. So we'll make sure that we have a link in the um, podcast notes. But Daniel, I hope I didn't um, go to the retreat too soon. Was there anything else you wanted to share with the audience about Ayurveda or your experiences? So, like you said earlier, Roy was a big inspiration for me to find Ayurveda. He, when he's the conversation that he suggested it to me to look at, um, I have a background in Chinese theory. Um, Qigong, again, Tai Chi, both of those are Chinese martial arts. That's what I looked into most when I was younger was Chinese medicine. Um, I didn't necessarily have that conversation with Roy, although I believe I had mentioned to him in the past that I was interested in such things. But when he when he um, suggested that I look into Ayurveda, it just happened to be that I was rooming with Ryan Strong, who then connected me with Vishnu Das, who became my first Ayurveda teacher in Asheville, North Carolina. And accordingly... Immediately after I met uh, Vishnu, finished his class, he turned me on to Carol the Ayurveda Academy. And all of that sprang literally domino effect from Roy to Dr. J at Kerala. Like it was just a string of providential occurrences. There's no other way to put that. So I find Ayurveda to be invigorating to me, both physically and spiritually. Roy talks about that in his writings on it, even though he doesn't use those words explicitly, it's very apparent when you read his words, what his meaning is. And Ayurveda is a, is a very beautiful system. It is very common sense in some aspects. It is very heady and theoretical in others. And that's the beauty of it to me. I find it to be an ever-blooming flower, an ever-blooming lotus of wisdom, because it can be the most simple Flowers grow in the dirt. Okay, yes, obviously. But it can also go to the most theoretical. Like, what inspired the energetic matrix of this flower to be in its shape? The interplay of the doshas for it. Like, it's just a beautiful system that just goes from mundane to spiritual without ever actually changing words, without ever actually changing perspectives. It just enlightens us to the fact that the perspective was the same the entire time. As within, so without, and as above, so below. And I love how you said how it unfolded for you meeting your next teacher and then the next teacher. And, and that ties into our podcast, Being Spirit-Led. You took Roy's advice and it opened up a doorway for you to study for many years and help others. So thanks for sharing that. I am happy to be here, able to share it. Yeah. Well, and what is the best way if someone did want to contact you, whether it was for some Ayurvedic um, coaching or just to ask you other questions, what would be the best way for someone to get in touch with you? The best way is through, um, I believe my phone number is published on the CSA website. You can give me a call, shoot me a text, or you can give me an email. Any of those are, I will answer those most readily. You can contact me on social media as well. I'm a little more sporadic on there, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a good thing if I have a little distance from that. Well, cool. Well, um, I know that we had chatted before about possibly closing the podcast with a special chant. So would you tell us about that? Sure. So one of the most um, common chants that you find in India, one of my most favorite chants is the Gayatri Mantra. And the Gayatri Mantra starts out with three words that are just intoning our three levels of existence, Uva, Swaha, and that is earth realm, 
energetic realm, spiritual realm, more or less. We can do physical, astral, causal, if you like those words. Um, and then it goes into a prayer that is basically, if you translate it literally, it's a prayer to the sun, thanking it for life. If you translate it spiritually, it is a prayer to our inner divinity for granting us the enlightenment of the experience. And that, again, to me, really shows the depth of thought and philosophy that we're talking about, because it can be physical. Thank you for the sun for giving us the light that photosynthesizes the plants for us to have food. Thank you, inner divinity, for allowing us to have this consciousness that we can reflect on our experiences to gather this information, to grow in this life towards our ultimate spiritual enlightenment. Yay. Well, I tell you what, let's, I always like to let the listeners hear um, my guests with their closing prayer or closing chant at the end. So I'll go ahead and thank you for joining today and, and sharing so much with us. I really learned a lot. Thank you, Joan, for having me. It's it's wonderful to be here with you. Yes. And we are going to, you'll, you'll just, I know you'll come back. We'll have you for some more questions. So any listeners, if you have questions about Ayurveda, please make a comment on the podcast so we can bring Daniel back and ask him some more. So um, I'll say goodbye for now. And, um, and then we'll hear the Gayatri Mantra. Om Bhuva Swaha Tatsavitur Varenium Argo Devasya Dhimahi Yo Yona Prachodayat Om Shanti 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 Thank you for tuning in to the Spirit Led Podcast. Special thanks to our producer, Monty Craig. Please subscribe to catch upcoming episodes. For support in your awakening journey, visit our sponsor, the Center for Spiritual Awareness at CSA davis.org we offer online group meditations classes and in-person retreats at our headquarters in lakemont georgia once again that's csa davis.org until next time remember your pure essence of being an eternal relationship with the infinite